Do you think you know everything about Moses? Think again. Today, we're going to unveil 10 astonishing facts that challenge everything you thought you knew about this biblical giant. Stay with us until the end and join in a powerful prayer that could change your life today. Are you curious to uncover hidden secrets in the life of Moses? Then stick around, because what we're about to reveal will surpass all expectations. As you gear up for this astonishing journey through the corridors of time, ask yourself, how much do we truly know about Moses, the man chosen by God to lead a nation to freedom? Many of us have grown up hearing his stories, but today we delve beyond the traditional tales. Are you ready to challenge your beliefs and expand your understanding? Let's dive into 10 little-known facts about Moses that not only reveal the complexity of his divine mission, but also the depth of his relationship with God. These discoveries are not merely intriguing. They have the power to transform our own perception of faith. Prepare to have your mind opened and your heart touched, as each fact unveils a new layer of understanding about this unparalleled leader. Fact number one. Did you know that Moses asked God to erase his name from the Book of Life? But what drove Moses to make such a dramatic request? And what can we learn from it? This incident coincided with the episode of the Golden Calf Worship. The story of the Golden Calf sheds light on human nature and the tendency for individuals to stray from their commitments to God. Ironically, while Moses was on Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments directly from God, the Israelites were violating the First Commandment which states, You shall have no other gods before me. The Israelites' impatience during Moses' prolonged stay on Mount Sinai led them to conceive the idea of creating a new god to guide and worship. To achieve this, they melted down their gold jewelry and used the metal to construct the golden calf. Their impatience drove them to turn to Aaron, entrusting him with the role of their spiritual guardian in Moses' absence. Aaron, complying with their request, fashioned the gold earrings into a sculpted golden calf, an act explicitly forbidden. They then indulged in idolatry, worshipping the idol while engaging in immoral behaviors such as eating, drinking, and reveling. God then said to Moses, Go down quickly, for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly from the way I commanded them. They have made themselves a molten calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Exodus 32, 7, 8. When Moses descended from the mountain, he met Joshua on the way and arrived at the people as they were engaged in their idolatrous and sensual feast. In righteous anger, he broke the tablets of the law as a testimony to what the people had already done. Exodus 32, 31, 34. 30. Moses then returned to the Lord and said, Oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They have made for themselves gods of gold. Now please forgive their sin, but if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. Exodus 32, 31, 32. The Lord replied to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. Now go, lead the people to the place I have spoken of, and my angel will go before you. Exodus 32, 33, 34. Moses did not minimize the seriousness of the sin, nor did he attempt to lessen its impact. Despite the enormity of the people's sin, Moses pleaded for forgiveness, appealing to God's mercy and grace. He implored God to forgive Israel through his own sacrificial identification with the sinful people. If God refused to forgive, Moses asked to be condemned as a sacrifice for his sinful people. Moses felt that Israel's sin was so severe that not even the blood of an animal could cover it. It would have to be a man who suffered in their place. Thus he offered himself to be blotted out from God's book if it could somehow redeem the people. God denied Moses' request, but we might say that God was anticipating the sacrifice of someone greater than Moses, who would give his life for the people, bringing a complete and definitive redemption. Naturally, Jesus had the same sacrificial heart when he died for our sins. Fact number two, 
Moses and the Bronze Serpent. In the biblical books of Kings, there is reference to the image of a serpent wrapped around a pole known as the Nehushtan. This image is described in the Book of Numbers, following the liberation from Egypt. The people began to complain about their living conditions, and as a direct response, God sent fiery serpents among them. Many people died, and many more were on the verge of death. In response to Moses' prayer, God commanded that a bronze serpent be raised on a pole, promising that anyone who looked at the bronze serpent would be healed from the snake bite they had received. The Israelites began to worship the fiery serpent that Moses had made from bronze. At some point, between Moses and Hezekiah. The bronze serpent is mentioned in connection with Hezekiah's reforms, but the worship of the Nehushtan could have been occurring long before Hezekiah, as reported in 2 Kings 18.4. He removed the high places of pagan worship, smashed the sacred stones, and cut down the Asherah poles. He also destroyed the bronze serpent that Moses had made, for up to those days, the Israelites had been burning incense to it, and it was called Nehushtan, a bronze sculpture. Although it is easy to see how something that brought miraculous healing could become an object of worship, it was still a flagrant disobedience to God's commands. The bronze serpent was God's method of deliverance during the incident recorded in Numbers 21. There is no indication that God intended it to have any other application. It is interesting to note that the literal translation of the word Nehushtan is piece of bronze. It is possible that Hezekiah gave it this name so people would remember it was just a piece of bronze and held no power of its own. Even in the situation described in Numbers 21, it was God who performed the healing, not the Nehushtan. Fact number three, why did God nearly kill Moses in Exodus? In the episode of the burning bush, God chose Moses to free the Israelites from servitude in Egypt and lead them to the promised land. Moses is known as the giver of the law and mediator of the ancient covenants. The encounter with God at the burning bush, where God called Moses to be the savior of his people, was a pivotal event in Moses' life. The Lord promised Moses that he would liberate his people from Egypt and lead them to a land of abundance, namely Canaan. Forty years after fleeing to Midian, Moses returned to Egypt by God's command, accompanied by his wife and sons, Zipporah, Gershom, and Eliezer. However, before Moses could deliver the message, he had to learn obedience himself. He failed to circumcise his own son, Gershom or Eliezer, possibly due to opposition from Zipporah. The text from Exodus chapter 4 verses 24 to 26 reveals a startling encounter. While camped at night, the Lord met Moses and sought to kill him. Zipporah quickly performed the circumcision of her son with a flint knife and threw the foreskin at Moses' feet, saying, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. This incident served as a harsh but necessary reminder of the importance of obedience to God's commandments, even in family matters. Moses was on a divine mission, but he had neglected a crucial covenant practice, which nearly cost him his life. This episode underscores that no leader, not even Moses, is above God's law. God is very stern in his judgments because he is just, and his word remains unwavering. God planned to take Moses' life, for he was to teach God's law to the Israelites, yet he was violating it himself. Thus, while Moses was destined to be the deliverer, he had to address areas in his own life that were misaligned with God's holiness. This level of judgment is also applied to the Israelites. God shows us that he will not use an unjust people to judge others. Moses was unfit to serve as a spiritual leader due to his unresolved sin, and the issue had to be remedied before he could adequately fulfill his task. Once Zipporah completed the task, the Lord spared him. Fact number four. Did you know why Moses was not allowed to enter the promised land? Sometimes the punishment does not seem to match the crime. At first glance, Moses striking a rock in the desert out of frustration with the Israelites does not seem like a just reason for him being denied entry to the promised land. After all, 
He had witnessed the ten plagues, led Israel out of Egypt and through the Red Sea, delivered the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, and won many of Israel's battles. So why would God allow a single strike on a rock at Meribah to prevent Moses from entering the land God had promised to Israel? The Israelites complained to Moses about the lack of water and also put the Lord to the test. Then Moses cried out to the Lord for help, saying, What shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. Exodus 17, 4. God then instructed Moses to go before the people with some of the elders of Israel, carrying the staff with which he had struck the Nile, and go to the rock at Horeb. There God would stand before him on the rock, and Moses was to speak to the rock so that water would flow from it, providing the people with drink. Moses followed God's instructions, and water flowed from the rock, providing drink for the Israelites. Exodus 17, 5, 6. However, consider what happened during the second occurrence at Meribah. When Moses became frustrated and disobeyed God, the Israelites arrived at the desert of Zin, near Kadesh, and once again complained about the lack of water. Numbers 21, 13. At that time, God told Moses to take the staff, gather the people, and speak to the rock in front of them, so that it would yield water. However, Moses, angered by the people's rebelliousness, struck the rock twice with his staff instead of speaking to it as God had commanded. Water gushed out abundantly, and the people and their livestock drank. But God said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me to uphold my holiness in the eyes of the Israelites, you shall not bring this assembly into the land I have given them. Numbers 2012. These are the waters of Meribah, where the children of Israel contended with the Lord, and he was sanctified among them. The incident in Numbers 20 was a pivotal moment. Moses obeyed God by striking the rock in Exodus 17, but he disobeyed by striking the rock instead of speaking to it in Numbers 20. This act of disobedience symbolized a failure to honor God as holy before the people. Although Moses had faithfully followed God's instructions up to that point, his action at Meribah showed a lack of faith that had serious consequences, preventing him from entering the promised land. Fact number five, the magicians Moses confronted. The narrative of Pharaoh's magicians can be found in Exodus 7 and 8. When Moses and Aaron confronted Pharaoh in Egypt and demanded that he release God's people from slavery to validate their message, Moses and Aaron performed miracles. Moses holds a special place in history due to the extraordinary number and variety of miraculous deeds attributed to him. As it is written, all that mighty power and all the great terror that Moses performed we learn that Moses was unmatched in power and authority as he led the people of Israel. It is said that no other prophet like Moses has arisen in Israel since that time. Though great rulers, as well as leaders, prophets and priests, have emerged in Israel before the arrival of Jesus Christ, known as the Messiah, there was never another man who held all these offices in such a glorious manner as Moses. Even with Moses' miracles, he faced opposition from Jan and Jombres. God instructed Moses and Aaron to show a sign to Pharaoh at their first meeting with the king by throwing Aaron's staff to the ground. God knew that Pharaoh would demand a sign. After Aaron did this, the staff in his hand turned into a snake. Pharaoh quickly called his magicians, each of whom was able to turn his own staff into snakes. Aaron's snake then devoured the snakes that had been used by the magicians, which must have been interpreted as a sinister warning to Pharaoh's court. Yet Pharaoh's heart remained hardened as the Lord had predicted. Aaron's snake's victory over those of the magicians symbolized God's supremacy over the false gods of Egypt, reaffirming Moses' position as a God-anointed leader capable of performing wonders in the name of the Lord. The first plague that Moses brought upon the Egyptians was turning the waters of the Nile into blood. Moses and Aaron followed God's instructions. Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt and all the waters turned into blood, killing the fish and making the river stink so badly that the Egyptians could not drink its water, Exodus 7, 19, 22. 
Interestingly, the Egyptian magicians were also able to replicate this miracle, turning more water into blood. This act by the magicians may seem counterproductive, as they only added to the affliction of their own people instead of trying to reverse the plague. This reflects the nature of occult arts rituals, which often do not aim to alleviate human suffering, but to demonstrate power even at the expense of those they should protect. The second miracle that Moses imposed on the Egyptian people was a plague of frogs. The magicians, maintaining their pattern, were able to conjure more frogs, exacerbating the problem rather than solving it. However, after this plague, the magicians' ability to replicate the signs ceased and they recognized that they were witnessing the finger of God. Exodus 8:19. From that point on, it was clear that although Satan could give the magicians the ability to mimic some of God's miracles, the divine supremacy and authority of God would ultimately triumph over any deception. In fact, number six, the only man whom God buried. Moses is notably known as the only man whom God had the privilege to bury with his own hands. At the end of his earthly life, Moses climbed to the top of Mount Nebo from where God showed him the promised land, a view spanning from Gilead to Dan, covering all the territory of Naphtali, Ephraim and Manasseh up to the Mediterranean Sea to the west. Deuteronomy 34, 1, 3. Moses, known as the servant of Yahweh, exemplified this designation throughout his life, waiting for instructions from the Lord as a servant waits for his master and striving to follow the pattern shown to him on the sacred mountain. His dedication to God was unwavering. He never neglected or burdened his office. His reverence for the name of the Lord was profound. His loyalty to the cause of the Lord was constant and his faith in the word of the Lord steadfast. Despite being a servant of God, Moses had to face death, a fate that befalls most people. However, only two people in biblical history were taken to heaven without experiencing death, and Moses was not one of them. Yet, at the end of his life, God allowed Moses to glimpse the land for which he had left Egypt. Moses ascended Mount Nebo from the plains of Moab to the summit of Pisgah, the circumstances of Moses' death are remarkably extraordinary. Mount Pisgah is about 4,500 feet high, nearly a mile high. Not many 120-year-old men can climb such a high mountain and live to tell the tale. Yet Moses did so, climbing with his own hands without the need for trails. There at the top, with the view of Canaan unfolding before him, Moses was not filled with self-pity. The extraordinary scene of the man of God, alone at the summit of the mountain with the view of the promised land stretched out below him, is powerful and symbolic. His death did not catch him by surprise. By, in Deuteronomy 4, 8, the final words that God addressed to Moses resonate with unyielding solemnity. This is the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have allowed you to see it with your own eyes. However, you will not cross this river. You will not set foot in it. And there in the lands of Moab, Moses, the faithful servant of the Lord, gave up his spirit as commanded by God. Fact number seven, the unknown burial place of Moses. Moses' death was not a tragedy, but the culmination of a life dedicated to God's service. He knew some time before that he would die without setting foot in Canaan, as revealed by God himself. The way Moses faced his death is a testament to God's grace. He never complained or prayed against his imminent fate. To this day, the location of his eternal rest remains a mystery, veiled by the veils of time. At the age of 120, Moses departed from this life with clear vision and intact vitality a testimony to his exceptional closeness to God. For 30 days, the plains of Moab were filled with the mourning of the Israelites as they lamented the loss of their leader, whose life had been a tapestry of miracles, trials and revelations, until the time for mourning was consumed, leaving only the memory of his indelible leadership and the pain of an inevitable farewell. 
God chose to hide Moses' burial place, possibly to prevent it from becoming a shrine, a place of pilgrimage that could divert true worship from God to the veneration of a man. The concealment of the tomb was so important to the Lord that it even provoked an angelic confrontation, as mentioned in the book of Jude. Fact number eight, the dispute over Moses' body. In the book of Jude, a unique event in the Bible is mentioned. The dispute between Michael, the archangel, and the devil over the body of Moses. The exact dispute and its reasons are not described in detail, but it is suggested that the devil desired to know the burial location to potentially establish a shrine there. Michael, despite his great strength, did not bring a presumptuous judgment or slanderous accusation against the devil. He simply declared, the Lord rebuke you. This episode illustrates the obedience of righteous angels and their submission to God's authority. Submission as displayed by Michael does not diminish his strength, purpose or worth, but emphasizes the beauty and necessity of being aligned with God's will. These events reinforce the idea that true strength and authority come from living in accordance with God's designs, avoiding any form of idolatry and maintaining focus on worship and reverence due only to the Creator. Fact number nine, Moses encounters Jesus at the Transfiguration. The Transfiguration of Jesus is a remarkable event mentioned in each of the Gospels, standing out as evidence of his divinity. Jesus took only three of his followers, Peter, James, and John, to a high mountain after a series of miracles and predictions about his own death. There, the Transfiguration occurred, where Jesus' appearance was transformed, radiating light with his face shining like the sun and his clothes becoming as white as light, Matthew 17, 2. This moment of glory signals the real presence of God's kingdom among his people through the person of Jesus. In this event, the disciples witnessed a profound revelation of Jesus' identity and mission. During the transfiguration, two of the most important figures of the Old Testament, Moses and Elijah, appeared symbolizing the law and the prophets who testify to Jesus as the Messiah who fulfills the scriptures. Moses is seen as one of the greatest leaders of the Jews and the mediator of God's law, while Elijah is considered the forerunner of the Messiah, as mentioned in Malachi 4, 4, 6. The presence of both on the mountain with Jesus demonstrates the majesty of Jesus, transcending them both as he is called the Son of God. The cloud of God's presence, which appeared to Moses on Mount Sinai and filled the tabernacle with his Shekinah, as well as guided the Israelites in the desert and filled Solomon's temple, now demonstrates that Jesus fulfilled both the law and the prophets, showing his superiority over Moses and Elijah. They point to Jesus as the incarnate Son of God. When the disciples looked again, they saw only Jesus, indicating that all attention should now be focused on him, as Moses and Elijah would have preferred, since their greatest importance was to prepare the way for the Messiah, the Son of God, and his redemptive purpose. Although the disciples had the most explicit revelation of Jesus' identity, they still did not fully understand what they had witnessed. Fact number 10, Moses sees God. Moses had significant encounters with God, and in one of them, he explicitly asked for God's continuous presence to guide his people to Canaan, Exodus 33, 12, 17. Moses told the Lord that although God had chosen him to lead the people, he desired confirmation that God would be with him, expressing the desire to know God's ways more deeply and thus find favor in his eyes. God's response was a promise that his presence would accompany Moses and that he would give him and the people rest by leading them to the promised land. Moses responded that if God's presence did not go with them, they should not depart, as God's presence was the assurance that he and the people had found favor in his eyes. This dialogue highlights Moses' dependence on God and his desire to lead according to divine will. Moses had a deep desire to experience God's presence directly, not only through interventions or angelic messengers. 
After God promised to send an angel to accompany the Israelites, Moses expressed his desire for something more intimate and personal. He wanted God himself to be with them, reflecting the depth of his relationship with the divine. In Exodus 34, 5, 7, God responded to Moses' desire by descending in a cloud and proclaiming his own name, revealing his attributes of mercy, grace, patience, kindness, and faithfulness. This moment was crucial for Moses, as it not only solidified his understanding of God's nature, but also reinforced the promise that God's presence would be with him, strengthening his role as a leader and mediator between God and the Israelites. This relationship between Moses and God is an example of direct and personal interaction. Moses was not satisfied with just the miracles and provisions he had witnessed, such as the burning bush, the parting of the Red Sea, or the manna from heaven. He longed for a deeper and more personal knowledge of God. As he himself requested, teach me your ways so I may know you, Exodus 33:13. This quest for a deeper relationship is what distinguishes Moses as a remarkable spiritual leader and an example for all those who desire to know God more intimately. This desire reflects what is expressed in Psalm 42, 1, 2, where the psalmist compares his longing for God to that of a deer longing for flowing streams. Moses, like the deer, had an insatiable thirst for God, a pursuit that goes beyond physical needs and extends to the spiritual and the eternal. Moises's life is a testimony to what it truly means to know God. This knowledge is not merely intellectual, but a living relationship that transforms. Jesus Christ, mentioned in John 17, three as the one sent by God, exemplifies and fulfills this quest. Jesus not only continued Moses' legacy as a mediator, but transcended it, offering himself as the ultimate way for us to personally know God. Thus, Moses' mission foreshadows and points to the coming of Christ, the supreme mediator in whom God was also well pleased and through whom we have direct access to the Father. Moses, even after experiencing numerous manifestations of God's power, still longed for more. He made a special request to the Lord, now show me your glory, Exodus 33:18. This request reflects a deep desire to see a visible manifestation of God's divinity, something beyond the interactions he had already experienced. Moses was not satisfied with just teachings and worship. He desired a deeper understanding and experience of God's glory. God responded to Moses by promising to pass all his goodness before him and proclaim his name, affirming his mercy and compassion. However, he warned Moses that he could not see his face, for no one may see me and live. Exodus 33, 20. To protect Moses, God said he would put him in a cleft of the rock and cover him with his hand as he passed by, allowing Moses to see only his back after he had passed. Exodus 33, 21, 23. This encounter emphasizes the holiness and transcendence of God while demonstrating his intimacy and accessibility to Moses. The experience was so powerful that Moses' face literally shone with the glory of God, reflecting the wonder and sacredness of the encounter. Just as Moses caught a glimpse of God's glory, we, as Christians, have the privilege of knowing God through Jesus Christ. Jesus affirmed, Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. John 14, 9. This tells us that in Jesus, the fullness of divinity was revealed in a way that is accessible and understandable to us. Therefore, through Christ, we have access to God's presence in a more complete and intimate way than Moses did. While Moses needed to be shielded from the full glory of God in Christ, we are invited to approach with confidence, no longer separated by the need for divine protection, but brought near by Jesus' sacrifice and mediation. God's revelation in Christ is the ultimate and complete fulfillment of the promise to know and see God's glory, as expressed in Moses' interactions with him. This continuity between the Old and New Testaments shows how Jesus' mission fulfills and transcends Moses' journey of faith. 
offering all of us as Christians the chance to walk by faith with God, knowing Him face to face through Jesus. Through Christ, we experience the true glory of God, not just as a fleeting glimpse, but as a constant and transforming presence in our lives. Beloved, I invite each of you to join together in spirit and truth for a special prayer. Let us lift up our hearts and voices to the Lord, seeking the same closeness with God that Moses had. May we, through this prayer, feel the powerful presence of the Holy Spirit among us, as Moses did when he caught sight of the Promised Land. Almighty Lord, we approach you with humble hearts and thirsty spirits. You are the source of all life and the light that guides our path. In this moment of prayer, we ask that your presence become even more real in our lives, filling us with your Holy Spirit and guiding us in every step we take. Father, we acknowledge that without you, we can do nothing. Therefore, we implore you to teach us to trust fully in your word and to live according to your will. May your love and kindness be the soil in which our lives flourish. And may your truth be the light that dispels all darkness around us. Grant us, Lord, a heart that seeks to know you more each day. Amid the tribulations and challenges of this world, may we find in you our strength and our refuge, and may our journey be a testimony of your grace and mercy to everyone around us. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Discover in the first comment our exclusive ebook on how to overcome challenges and live an abundant life that you need to know. Click now.